All looks good, Mark. Thank you. Okay, let's begin then. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Um, wherever you are in the world, I know there are quite a few of you from, from all over watching on YouTube. We have people um, on Zoom from the Society as well. I'm very excited about this talk tonight. It's a, a very timely talk from Dennis Vida uh, about the Global Media Network, given the excitement that we've had in Scotland over the last couple of um, days about a, an amazing fireball that a lot of people saw. Um, a few slides from me, and then it'll be over uh, to Dennis. So this is what we've got coming up tonight. Um, I've got a, a few bits of uh, news for the Society. I'll cover um, what talks we've got coming up soon. And then it will be over to Dennis, who is um, live in London, Ontario uh, tonight, today, today for you, I'm not sure. Um, and we'll, we'll hear from, from Dennis then. Um, yes, um, our membership is growing quite strongly at the moment. That's, that's where we stand at the moment, 179. Um, we've more than doubled over the lockdown period. People seem to have taken an interest in astronomy, which is great. Um, visitors are always welcome to our meetings without joining. Uh, it's always free. Um, if you do want to get more involved, it's pretty reasonable. Uh, but it's entirely your choice. A couple of news items. Um, society members will be at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh for their doors open days on the 24th and 25th of September. Uh, we'll be taking along our solar telescope so that people can safely look at the sun. Um, it's always uh, good fun. If you do want to go to that, I suggest you go onto the Royal Observatory website and book a slot. It will be a busy day um, and it's the only way of guaranteeing that you'll get in. Can I just say, Mark, it would be useful to add a couple of more volunteers for the Sunday. Okay, so society members, if you're able to come along, whether you can bring a solar telescope or not, doesn't really matter. If you're able to come and, and help us, that would be great. So uh, let Peter or myself know, that would be great. Uh, another event that's happening um, on the 25th of October, there's going to be a partial eclipse of the sun visible from Edinburgh. Uh, we hope to be live streaming that from up on Colton Hill, um, the place that we used to be, used to run um, using the very historic Cook six inch uh, refractor. This will be the first time it's been back in operation for almost 15 years. So um, Jim Anderson has been working on that to, to get it working again, freeing up all this, the stiff bits and pieces. So that will be quite a nice event so we'll we'll stream that live on youtube but we'll also be um taking our solar telescopes up there as well so if people want to turn up and look through the solar telescopes they can do that um we can't really get people in the dome at the moment that's limited space but if you want to come up and see us there you can or watch on youtube Lots of ways of staying in touch with us everything that we're doing you'll always find on our website astronomyedibra.org Lots of stuff on YouTube, uh, on uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter feed, and you can see several years of really amazing talks on our YouTube channel. Um, this talk will be there afterwards as well. Um, some amazing speakers, and, uh, and uh, if you're short of something to do, you know, you'll find something really interesting on there as well. These are the talks we've got coming up over the next couple of months. Uh, we've got talks planned well into next year already now. Uh, but the next one will be on the 7th of October. Um, that's about the ground effects of space weather and Gemma Richardson from the British Geological Survey. That will be a hybrid meeting. So if you can join us in Edinburgh at the Augustine United Church and George IV Bridge in Edinburgh, that'd be great. Otherwise, it will be streamed on Zoom for ASE members and live on YouTube for, for anyone who wants to watch. Um, uh, we have our Imaging Observing Group um, meeting on the 12th of October. That's for members only. That's where we all get together and, and learn from each other and chat about various um, observing and imaging techniques. This time we've got a, a special guest speaker. He's going to be telling us about, about radio astronomy and how amateurs can get involved in that. Um, I know the Society has in the past actually had access to radio telescopes and I've done a bit of that, but we haven't done that for a long time, I don't think. 21st of October, this will be an online only talk, um, Space Art, Art and its Influence on Our Understanding of the Cosmos from 
Greg Smy runs me out. Sounds sounds like a slightly different talk from our normal scientific ones, but we we quite like mixing it up, and that should be really nice. As I said, we have um, a live stream of the partial solar eclipse, um, weather permitting, which is never a guarantee here in Edinburgh. So um, we'll keep you up to date on whether that's going to happen or not. 4th of November, Professor Ian Robson from the Royal Observatory of Edinburgh will tell us the Pluto story, um, all about the history of observations, um, its demotion to a, to a dwarf planet and um, all sorts of other things about it as well. Um, November, our imaging observing group as usual. And on the 18th of November, we have Patrick Bath from St. Andrews University. What makes a planet habitable from life on Earth to life on extra solar planets? So lots of good things coming up. Um, keep an eye on our website and um, you're always welcome to join us um, live on YouTube or in person in Edinburgh if you can. That's enough from me. Um, Thank you, Dennis, for, uh, for doing this chat for us. It is um, really um, great that you're doing it just now because there's a, an awful lot of interest in um, Scotland and Edinburgh um, about meteors at the moment. So, um, yeah, I'll stop sharing and pass that over to you. So take it away. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, happy to be here. Let me just uh, share my screen and let me know if you can see my title slide. Yeah, you can see that in the problem. Thank you. Perfect. So, um, yeah, I'm Dennis. Uh, I am at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, and we have a really good meteor group here. Uh, I am currently a postdoc, which is basically once you finish your PhD for a couple of years, you're trying to find a job, see if you're going to stay in academia or if you're going to move to industry. So basically, I'm at that stage. Um, other than that, I've been, uh, my side project is a global media network. I was actually an amateur astronomer. And uh, my background is actually in computer science. Uh, I was studying to be a software engineer and I had a couple, some work experience in that. And then I realized that at least to me, it was a bit boring and I switched uh, careers and I started a PhD in astronomy. And basically that's where I am right now. And I found that I could apply my software engineering skills uh, to um, meteor science, which is something that I've been, um, where, where my main focus of my amateur efforts was. Um, and after a couple of years, we have grown our small local network into a global network of over what is now 700 cameras across the world. Uh, now before I get into that, I'm, I want to tell you something about meteor science and something really that I find incredibly exciting. Uh, and one mission of the Global Meteor Network is not only to spread cameras across the globe, but to really uh, share this excitement and really the, the, the science behind all of it. Because I feel that uh, we get to hear a lot about all sorts of different other areas of astronomy, black holes and dark energy, dark matter, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't really get to hear a lot about planetary science and meteors in particular. And I wish to change that. So let's begin. The, we've all been outside during the night, looked up, we've seen a couple of meteors, maybe observed a meteor shower. Um, you know, lucky individuals have also observed maybe a meteorite fall. It's very rare, but people have seen it, which is kind of a very impressive once in a lifetime event. Uh, but what are we actually seeing when we see a meteor? Where, well, we actually see two different uh, phenomena. On the one hand, we have larger rocky objects that are coming from, um, from asteroids. So asteroids collide and then produce very small fragments and they sometimes intersect the Earth the Earth's atmosphere, enter the atmosphere, and if they're large enough and slow enough, they survive and they land as a meteorite. On the other hand, we have literally tails of comets that have dispersed, but they're still there, that contain very, very small, tiny millimeter size or smaller dust particles, and there are a lot of them. And when the Earth intersects that old, uh, what we call a meteoroid stream, 
it produces a meteor shower. So these two things are completely different, come from completely different bodies. Comets are very icy, asteroids are rocky, and our field studies both. So why do we care about the big stuff, the big rocks? Well, really primarily it's from the planetary defense perspective. So um, every two weeks we, we get hit by a one meter asteroid. So that's actually quite small. It usually completely disintegrates in the atmosphere. And there are US government sensors, literally just kind of cameras on top of on spy satellites that are observing uh, every single uh, portion of our planet, and they're logging the, these big impacts. And on the CNEOS NASA website, you can actually look, look it up and see that there are actually some quite big impacts. So we want to make sure to log all of them and understand uh, what the potential danger is for any some sort of a, a impact on, let's say, some medium timescales kind of a, a 100 year time scales and that's not really surprising there are so many impacts if we look at our uh environment there are a lot of uh, main belt asteroids near Earth asteroids we live in a what is a shooting gallery uh but fortunately so far there aren't any dangerous asteroids that we know of that might impact for sure in the next 100 years so we're safe there and we mostly concentrate on the smaller stuff that is interesting interesting in its own way. So um, if you've ever been to a natural history museum, either the one in London or, for example, this one in Vienna, both are very beautiful, all of them have meteorite collections. So these are rocks that people have usually found that have fell a very long time ago. However, these rocks are so unusual, they're unlike any Earth rocks, and people have realized that, put them in a lab, study them, analyze them, and then and they end up in a museum so people can admire them. However, the problem with all of these rocks is that they lack what we call any dynamical context. Well, what does that even mean? So we don't know where these rocks come from. There are big books written by uh, scientists who study uh, meteorites, meteoritical science, and many journals that have put forward a lot of very interesting theories about the formation of the solar system, what meteors tell us about uh, that and yet we don't really know from which part of the solar system uh, they came from. We have kind of bits and pieces and, a lot, and some evidence, but the problem is that up until maybe 70 years ago, we haven't really observed a meteorite fall uh, using any sort of instrument. So the first one was in the Czech Republic in the 1950s, where they had like a dedicated all sky camera and they computed, they observed the fireball, they computed the trajectory, predicted where the meteorites uh, were supposed to land and they actually found it. So this way you have a piece of a space rock, a piece of an asteroid from the asteroid belt that you know exactly where it came from. So it's kind of similar to some sort of a sample return mission. However, you know, why are meteorites interesting? So um, these rocks have remained in the solar system for 4.5 billion years. They're the oldest stuff that exists in the solar system. And they have formed just very shortly after the solar system, just the first solids uh, appeared. When it cooled down sufficiently, uh, that condensation happened. And this is kind of like the original stuff that was in the solar system. And what's really interesting is that they're kind of like building blocks of everything, but some meteorites contain amino acids, uh, DNA nucleobases. So it appears that they had kind of all sorts of ingredients for life, but we still need to understand, um, uh, understand where they come from and what kind of environment these rocks were in so we can unlock the secret of life. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, and as I said before, they are kind of like a sample return mission. Um, not really, we can't really compare the kind of the quality of a sample that like a Hayabusa or Osiris Rex would actually go to an asteroid and they actually grab a piece of the asteroid and there's like an airtight container and they bring it back and I was like, we can't compare that, you know, to say that they're equivalent. However, these missions are ridiculously expensive. And the cheaper way to sample the whole solar system is just to have a meteor network and to observe. And once a meteorite falls, you compute it, you go out and you recover it. 
Uh, many groups around the world that are doing that. Uh, one particular group that's very successful are these guys from Australia, where, I mean, it's very easy for them to find a black rock on a yellow slash orange desert, desert floor. Now, you know, good luck finding something in, you know, the UK and the forest in Central Europe or even here in Ontario. It's, it's much, much more difficult. Uh, but that's basically the goal of many media networks. Just to compare these two ways, so you can have uh, a media network where all the cameras and everything all together costs between ten and one hundred thousand dollars, and you can recover a lot of media rights, uh, hundreds of grams, sometimes kilograms, and you just wait a bit and you're gonna get another one. And on the other hand, you have these sample return missions, which cost billions of dollars and they return a tiny sample again they're not 100 percent equivalent but if you want to get a big statistical sample and we only have about 50 meteorites with that were observed falling uh that is the way to go and this is why we're doing it so again pros and cons of both one is cheap but the, the uh, material might be contaminated in a way falls into the ground gets rained on etc cetera, etc cetera. But that's why we want to go out there and recover it as soon as possible. On the other hand, the other one that you recover from the asteroid is pristine, but is it really worth the price? That's a good question. Um, now, one way, well, not one way, but uh, the way we think that meteorites arrive to Earth uh, is through a very interesting process uh, where first asteroids collide and they fragment into a million pieces. And then the solar wind, and because of what's called the Yarkovsky effect, they, it slightly moves, shifts their orbit in the solar system. And then they get stuck in orbital resonances. So what that basically means is that Jupiter has, is the biggest planet in the solar system and has certain clearing zones. So once the orbit, the frequency of the orbit uh, is kind of an integer, uh, nicely divisible with the uh, orbital period of Jupiter. That's called the resonance. And Jupiter tends to kind of kick out things that are in that orbit. And what happens is that when these little pieces get into resonance, that stuff gets pushed into the inner solar system, basically towards Earth. And that's how we get these pieces of, of asteroids from the actual uh, main belt uh, onto Earth, and then we cover them as meteorites. Um, What's really interesting is that we have a lot of, we know about different meteorite types uh, that we found. And the most interesting one are called chondrites. So imagine the very, very, very early solar system. There wasn't really much heating or anything. It's just, there was this stuff that everything was made of. And when we look at these chondritic uh, meteorites, we see they have little kind of flakes of iron and nickel, and they have organic matter, and they have all different sorts of silicates. It's all kind of put together in all sorts of uh, a fused together. And you kind of see like that is like the original stuff that everything is made of. However, these planetesimals, they grew over time into larger, larger, and larger asteroids. And once they reached a certain size, what happened was is they heated up. There were these radioactive elements that heated up everything, melted. And of course, the heavy stuff falls to the bottom, and you get iron meteorites from there. And the light stuff stays at the top, and we get achondritic stony meteorites, which are actually very, very hard to tell apart from Earth rocks if you just find them. Uh, they are very similar to what we get on Earth. You really need to put it in a lab to figure out what it is. Um, and the reason, you know, the way we got anything out of these big asteroids is because there was a collision that blew this asteroid apart. And we literally have a piece of a core of a giant 100 kilometer size asteroid. And this, these are actually iron meteorites. Um, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Not only that we have pieces of Mars. So we know of Martian meteorites, and they're the only samples of Mars that we have. Uh, as, as some of you might know, there's a rover on Mars currently that's actually drilling pieces of Mars, putting in a little capsules, and they're gonna do another mission trying to recover uh, these samples so we can study Mars in uh, the lab uh, on Earth. We can actually use these big expensive instruments and not something tiny that we can fit on a rover, to figure out, you know, what happened on Mars so long ago? Where is all the water? Was there any life on Mars? Um, and we can do something similar, again, 
through meteorites, when there's an asteroid impacting to Mars, rocks get ejected out, and then again, they travel through the solar system, they end up on Earth, and these are extremely, extremely, uh, extremely interesting, one of the most expensive meteorites uh, that you can find. And what's interesting, there is one down in North Africa called Black Beauty, and uh, three billion years ago, it turns out that there was a lot of water on Mars because uh, the water got trapped in uh, the meteorite and then arrived here, and this is one of the strongest evidence we have the real geological evidence that we studied here, here on Earth in a proper lab of uh, water on Mars. Um, and we also know uh, through study of meteorites that the way the solar system got uh, really started, where you know before we were just some sort of a cloud of gas and, uh, and matter, that there was actually a nearby supernova which uh, exploded, collapsed a cloud, and actually seeded seeded it with um, a lot of uh, with a lot of aluminum twenty six, which is a radioactive element that decays into um, magnesium twenty six. So, um, and then we can apply really the same way of thinking, the same observation that we got from meteorites to exoplanets to really figure out how they're forming. And here, if we look at the Orion's Nebula, we can see a lot of star forming regions, which the same thing is really happening that happened here over you know, four and a half billion years ago. And really the meteorites can give us the, the kind of the missing story where we're trying to reconstruct the story of the formation of the solar system, really how everything started. How can we even go from just a cloud of gas to whole planets and life and uh, whatever we have? It's still a story full of holes, but using meteorites, using these observations, we're trying to piece it all together. And that was basically a short story about the smaller stuff um, that we found on Earth. However, every once in a while, something like this happens. Uh, some of you may remember that about 10 years ago, there was a giant uh, fireball observed, observed in Russia. Uh, this was in 2013 uh, in Chelyabinsk, and it was actually quite dangerous because the huge fireball exploded with an energy of basically a nuclear bomb. And it was um, a thousand times brighter than the sun. And here, you might hear actually fragmentations of the fireball. that caused a lot of damage. Uh, and the energy estimate, again, is between 400 and 600 kilotons of TNT, which is equivalent to what is a warhead in uh, kind of the normal warhead in uh, our nuclear arsenals. And just as a comparison, you know, Hiroshima was about you know, 30 times less powerful uh, than, um, than this event. Uh, what's really interesting is that um, we couldn't really see this coming. This was kind of the biggest um, biggest asteroid that entered the, the, the atmosphere and caused some damage in, uh, in recent years. Of course, the previous one was, uh, was Tenguska uh, in 1908, which again happened in Russia because it's such a giant country. Um, and it's interesting if you, know, you know, if you ask me, how come we didn't see this coming? It was a pretty big... Uh, 20 meter asteroid. Don't we have telescopes looking up and trying to find this stuff? Well, it turns out that if we look back uh, for about 20 years before this happened, um, it just wasn't detectable. It, it would, its magnitude was usually around plus 26, which is just not possible to detect with any uh, asteroid survey telescopes. Uh, and before that, we just didn't have telescopes or technology was sensitive enough to detect these asteroids. So if we actually look at how many asteroids of this size are known and discovered, it's just way, way less than uh, 1%. And even, um, even uh, about 100 meter size asteroids, which would cause kind of the unprecedented disaster in human history, we are currently, um, we know maybe about 50%. Uh, of them uh, so far. Uh, the good news is that all the big asteroids, all the um, uh, kilometer-sized asteroids and larger that 
are global killers. We discovered over 90% of them uh, at this point. So it's not really a really big problem, but these smaller ones can surprise us at any moment. Uh, and it's good to study them. Um, again, uh, good news is that we have uh, some telescopes that are coming online, especially the LSST, the Vera Rubin Space, uh, the Vera Rubin Telescope, uh, which is supposed to have its first light uh, in a year or two, hopefully. Uh, it's a new telescope in Chile, and now there are also a couple of space missions that are trying to discover um, asteroids. Um, a good question that some of you might have is, okay, you know, how often do these um, uh, impacts happen and, you know, should I be afraid? Um, and it's actually through our study of fireballs that we can answer that. This is one very, um, uh, a graph for, from one very famous paper where uh, actually my supervisor for the first time published the size frequency plot where you can basically see that um, fireballs such as uh, Chitterbins could they impact every 90 years or so. So let's say every 100 years, which is not really um, that often, but keep in mind that that is on a global scale. So to actually cause damage again, and they define the damage as like window breakage, assuming that a population uh, distribution stays the same uh, globally, it would only happen uh, once every 5,000 years. So this was really um, quite a rare event that we witnessed with, uh, with Chavis. So that's the big stuff. Um, that's kind of the, from the planetary defense perspective. And you know the, the summary here is that we're actually quite safe. Uh, it doesn't really happen that often. But how about the small stuff? You know, why do we even care about the space dust that comes from comets? I mean, you know, it's tiny millimeter size. I mean, who cares, right? The problem is that if you are an astronaut, you might want to know that a millimeter size dust particle flying at 20 kilometers a second, which is some sort of like an average velocity, has the equivalent kinetic energy of a rifle bullet. So it's not really nice if you're an astronaut working outside and, and then you want you get hit by this millimeter size asteroid. In fact, uh, a meteorite. So in fact, uh, every uh, spacewalk, and they usually last about eight hours, that's kind of the average, has um, actually a probability associated uh, with the spacewalk. It's about one in 5,000 that you will die due to a meteoroid impact. That's not that small, and that is only during um, and that is only during um, the period of nominal activity. So no major meteor showers uh, active. You know, if you go outside, let's say you know tonight we don't have any big showers like the Perseid or Gemini. So you look up, you might see just a couple of meteors an hour. So that is when the the one in five thousand chance applies. Uh, however, if you have a big meteor shower outburst. You have hundreds, thousands of meteors a night. Well, you know, would you take those chances? That's why we study meteor showers and we want to predict when they happen. Um, and it's also important to keep a satellite safe. So uh, the European Space Agency launched a satellite in 1989, which lasted for a couple of years until it was struck by uh, a Perseid during a Perseid outburst in August 1983. And what happened was that uh, the impact, because it was really high speed, generated a lot of plasma, which shorted uh, the attitude control system and it started tumbling. And they were able to stop that. However, they exhausted the fuel and they had to put the, um, put the satellite into graveyard orbit. So it was one of the most expensive uh, commercial satellites at the time which was lost because it was hit during um, a major uh, meteor shower, uh, meteor storm. And what we do is we actually provide NASA with uh, models and observations of meteor showers so they can actually make predictions and inform um, spacecraft operators, satellite operators to actually move and realign satellites in such a way that to either to turn the hard side towards the meteor shower radiant 
or to minimize the cross-sectional area. So obviously you do not want to have all these big solar panels turn directly towards the radiant. You might want to reorient the spacecraft in such a way that the chances are, are much, uh, much lower of an impact. Uh, there were a couple of other impacts. So uh, another European Space Agency satellite, um, an X-ray observatory was looking directly uh, into one source of sporadic uh, meteors, and it turns out that it got hit several times, and um, two of its uh, CCD sensors were lost because of that, because people kept keep ignoring uh, meteor science. Uh, and there's a, there was also a recent event with uh, the James Webb Space Telescope when it got hit by a big, uh, a big bigger meteoroid than they anticipated. It is still um, something that they're working on to figure out if there is a real issue. However, they recently published a paper where they admitted they haven't fully, um, their models don't include directionality, which basically means they don't, they haven't figured out that they are not supposed to point towards where very fast meteors are coming from. And if you remember anything from your high school physics, class uh if you are computing kinetic energy which is basically the energy of impact uh the energy goes up by the square of velocity so you don't want to be looking and pointing where fast meteors are coming from so hopefully uh people at james webb figure out that they're not supposed to point in certain directions but still again we're in progress um where do these small millimeter sized particles come from so as I said before, they come from comet, comet's tails. What happens is that when this big ball of uh, dust and ice comes into the inner solar system and it spends most of the time in the outer solar system where it's really, really cold, where it's frozen, it approaches the sun, uh, all these gases start sublimating from the surface. Uh, sublimation is basically like evaporation, but because the pressure is non-existent in space, it just doesn't really, or turn into liquid and then gas, it just goes straight from solid ice into gas. And all that gas then just takes the dust particles that are on the surface and ejects them out of the comet and that forms the comet's um, tail. And then every time the comet comes close to the sun, it ejects um, a new tail. And then after a period of time, because of the gravitational interaction with the planets, this tail gets very, very complex and all kind of twisted around. And sometimes it just might get twisted in such a way that intersects Earth. And then what we see is a meteor shower. And the reason why a meteor shower has a radiant, basically in the lower right, you can see um, that all meteors are coming from the same direction. Well, it's because all of these orbits are very similar to one another. They're parallel. And it's just a perspective effect. So if you have a, an observer here looking at orbits coming parallel towards you, you will see as if they're all coming from one, from one um, point in the sky. And that's basically the meteor shower read. Um, what happens in the atmosphere is that this dust particle collides with uh, air molecules. And uh, what we are only very recently starting to figure out about these is that they're not really kind of like solid monolithic like pieces of rock like little pebbles they're more like kind of a very loosely bound agglomeration of um little uh mi micron sized grains and what happens is that they actually fragment in the atmosphere they disrupt and when they're hit by air molecules, the surface of these little tiny particles gets so hot that the rock literally vaporizes. And that's what's going on in meteors. And because the temperatures are so high, they ionize the air around it and that air starts glowing. And that's basically what you see uh, in the sky. So a normal meteor, people get really surprised when I say this, it's, it's, it's usually a millimeter sized particle. It's not, not nothing bigger than that. It just it's so fast and has such a high energy that it can ionize air around it and it glow, uh, glow so much. Um, and again, we're interested in these meteor shower outbursts uh, because we want to figure out when they happen so astronauts and satellites can quote unquote duck and cover. 
And currently, we still have issues with making accurate predictions. So uh, in 2011, uh, a lot of different people predicted that there's going to be a big outburst of the draconic meteor shower, uh, which is usually has very, very low activity. But every once in a while, it has like a huge outburst and then nothing again for years. So in 2011, people predicted it. Many people went out, set up cameras, observed it. And it turns out it had a peak, uh, peak uh, rate of 300 meteors an hour. Just for reference, so NASA cancels all spacewalks during the Perseids and the Geminids. They happen every year on the same day with the same rate. And there is HR is about 150 meteors an hour, so half that. However, next year, in 2012, no one predicted anything. So they ran their simulations. They said, oh, 2012 is going to be a quiet year. Um, October comes and goes, and no one really noticed anything until Christmas of that year, where a student and my research group was bored and was looking through the data and found that, in fact, there was a huge, a giant meteor shower storm uh, of over 9,000 meteors an hour that first no one predicted and then no one even noticed. Um, and that was really a cause for concern because that, you know, if something was going on at this time, if there was a spacewalk or something like that could have been issues. Um, and this was really one of the reasons why we started the Global Media Network to make sure that we have good long-term observations uh, and then we can very accurately log and create these activity profiles so we can make better predictions. If we want to become, um, how can I put it, if we want to increase our human activity in space, we want to make sure that we got the basics right. And the basics are basically, if you're out there, don't get hit by a millimeter size pebble. It, it just simple as that. So what we really need is a geographically distributed scientific instrument. Uh, if you have, for example, a big meteor shower uh, like the Draconids, which lasted only an hour or so, and if it happened, let's say, over, uh, uh, let's say, the Pacific, but all your cameras are in Europe or North America and there was no one to observe it, it's, it would be as if, you know, not, nothing happened, no one would notice it. So what we really need is to have cameras across the globe. Um, and that is, of course, a giant logistical issue. Um, I mean, good luck while organizing something within the same region or country, uh, but doing it on a global scale is really a unique challenge. So we had to come up with something that can be deployed and hosted by amateur astronomers. Uh, we have a lot of experience with uh, giving cameras to institutions and they put it on their roof and something breaks and then, oh, it turns out only the janitor can get to the roof and the janitor is on holiday and then no one knows how to do blah, blah, blah. So it's, like, it's six months until someone actually gets there and fixes the camera. So our idea was basically, well, just put this on your home uh, and if something breaks, just you go out and fix it. Why, we, why do we need all this institutional overhead? It's just not necessary. Cameras work just as well on anyone's home as if on a, on a museum or university or whatever. Uh, we had to come up with something that has simple installation and maintenance, can't be too expensive, and that uh, the replacement parts are available locally and online that you can order stuff. It's not some sort of a specialized camera board that's only made in you know one country and it's very expensive, hard to get, blah, 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 blah. It had to be something uh, off the shelf readily available. So um, in 2018, we found the right combination of hardware parts and our software was fully matured. Uh, and we started the Global Media Network. Uh, the story is really funny. Uh, it was actually a friend of mine where uh, my, my friend and I were working on this project and we posted, uh, um, um, made a post on Cloudy Nights that uh, amateur astronomer forum where we basically said, oh, uh, we're just a bunch of PhD students who are working on this highly experimental meteor system. And we, uh, we made one camera system and we put it up on eBay. And if some of you guys want to buy it, you know, it's there, buy it, we're going to sell, sell it for maybe it was like 200 bucks at a time. Uh, we're not really trying to turn any profit on this. But just let me know what you think, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was um, it was the people from New Mexico, Pete Eshman, who bought the camera, 
And only about a month or two later, they bought 14 more. So it really, really took off pretty soon. And the, you know, then the next year, 2019, 2020, we had hundreds of cameras already. It, we were really, it was take, we were taken by surprise how fast uh, the network ex expanded. Um, in terms of the hardware itself, so we're using the Raspberry Pis, which before all the pandemic related issues were readily available and, you know, in everywhere for very cheap now, they're much harder to get, but we are finding alternatives. Um, and we are using off the shelf um, sensors, which when we combine with, again, very cheap lenses, which are, again, incredibly good. There was nothing like that available 10 years ago. They provide what is essentially the same sensitivity, the same frame rate, and the same field of view of a human eye. So it, it, took, it took technology so long for us to be able to achieve what we humans already have. It's just that this thing never gets tired. You can actually analyze it in a very formal way, you make the very, very good strict calibration. And of course, it's, it's dirt cheap. So the parts for all of this cost maybe $250. Uh, but they are plug and play systems sold by several private partners that go for maybe $450, maybe a bit more now. I think the, the price is maybe about 500 euros now uh, because of all the, again, inflation slash pandemic related uh, things. Uh, one thing that we really, really put a lot of time in uh, is making sure that we have software that is open source and the data that is open as well. So when I first started about 10 years ago or so, I was still an amateur astronomer, I, I got really frustrated because there was no data available anywhere. And the data you could find was of questionable quality. You, you didn't really know how people got from observations to the data. Uh, so really the biggest contribution that we made is the software. Um, the RMS software library, takes the raw video, does all the calibration, does the detection, does the measurements. And then we have another library that puts everything together, computes meteor trajectories, and computes other interesting things like meteor mass, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, there is also another thing that we wanted to tackle, and that is that uh, some previous um, professional meteor networks were funded by private money. So taxpayer money, you pay your taxes, and they get money, they get a, a research grant, and they built these cameras, people observe it, and then they keep the data closed, private, all by themselves. And that really made no sense to me. So I really wanted to show that you could do it, you could have open data, but to make things better, funded up by private money. So amateur astronomers buy these cameras, deploy these cameras, and then all the data that gets produced is public. So it's the other way around and it can be done. So everything that we do, all the meteor trajectories that the whole network observes uh, is, are publicly available within 24 hours of observation. And that really um, helps with the whole, uh, if, if there's like a meteor shower outburst, everyone knows and there's good data. And you know you can rely on this data. The methods are, are transparent. There are publications that are behind it and things are being checked. So every time something interesting happens, like we can characterize it and know everything about it within 24 hours. And that's what we, we aim for. Um, this is just a kind of a short a collage of, the, of how our data looks. So uh, in the upper left um, corner, you can see one image where we have a camera, a La Palma uh, in uh, the Canary Islands in Spain. And uh, our sensors are actually quite sensitive. So uh, regularly, if you have dark skies, you can get stars down to magnitude uh, plus six. Uh, we also have a dedicated fireball detector. So every time a fireball happens, there's a uh, code that goes in, detects fireballs. Instead of storing the whole giant videos, it actually just stores those little cutouts uh, of the fireball that are everything we need to analyze the meteorite fall. Um, when uh, big meteor showers happen, like the Geminids or the Perseids, the code automatically creates these stacks where you can see uh, all, the, all the meteors that were detected. Um, and we put a lot of focus on calibration methods. So the difference between an expensive toy and a scientific instrument is the calibration. 
so we have what I would call the industry leading uh, calibration method where we can take literally any type of data, as long as you see stars and there's a meter in it, we can analyze it. And we found that um, cameras tend to move throughout the night um, just because of thermal effects and not just a camera, but even the whole house can slightly move. You know, it's just like one arc minute, but we can still see it in, um, in our videos, uh, in, our, in our data. And we want to make sure that we calibrate for that uh, because the movement as you can see in the lower left can be up to 10 arc minutes throughout the night but our accuracy is about one arc minute and even better than arc minute in most cases so if you don't recalibrate it the pointing of the camera you're just going to have something that's 10 10 arc up to 10 arc minutes off and that's huge like uh it just makes no sense um and what we can do then we combine, we combine these observations and we can very accurately predict um, meteorite falls. So if we have cameras that observe uh, a meteorite fall very close, we can predict the endpoint um, up in the atmosphere to an, uh, to an accuracy of about 15 meters. And then from there, we run the code and predict where the fall zone is, depending on the winds and the possible mass, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in comparison to some other previous generation systems, you know, they could do to an accuracy of maybe 100 or so meters. So, you know, almost a factor of 10 better uh, than what the previous generation of, uh, of, of cameras could do. Um, and we don't only observe meteors and fireballs. We observe a lot of other um, atmospheric phenomena like sprites and elves, um, atmospheric um, um, messes, um, mesospheric lightning and stratospheric lightning, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm not an atmosphere physicist. However, we do have a huge repository uh, of this data. And as far as I understand, not a lot of observations exist uh, of sprites and elves, and people are still trying to figure out what they actually are. Um, now, in terms of what a user receives, what a user how the user interacts with the camera. So uh, we have a lot of automated scripts that generate visually attractive graphs that user can, users can share on social media or whatever. Um, and one of them is this kind of radiant graph where uh, our system automatically figures out which meteor showers are active and then takes all the observed meteors and traces them back to the meteor shower radiant. And you get nice plots like this uh, for uh, every every major meteor shower. And uh, not just that, but uh, our software is open source. So we have our members, um, they look at the available uh, code, the available scripts, and they say, oh, I can do better. So they actually code it up and contribute to the network. And everyone can now use this data. So uh, we have uh, one guy from the Netherlands here who decided to expand what was available to kind of make this nice uh, track and stack software and add the uh, constellation lines. And here you can see, well, this is Cassiopeia here, and this is Perseus here. So these were this year's Perseus. And these are actual meteors that were observed by, by his camera. And now there's a script where anyone can just go in and tell it, yeah, this is my data here, run it, and it's gonna generate something similar. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, all the cameras, all the, everything, uh, the processing is done uh, locally on the Raspberry Pis, and only the metadata is sent to the central server where we compute the trajectories and orbits and get, gets published and anyone can access this data. Uh, so we, as a network, uh, total we process, well, this number says 250 terabytes a night, but probably now it's all, all over 500 terabytes of, of, of data a night is what these the distributed systems process. And only a tiny portion of that gets, uh, gets reported to the central server, just the detections in the metadata. This is how the current coverage looks like. Uh, we have a lot of cameras in the UK, uh, especially in England, um, but the rest of the world is, is uh, well covered as well. There was a, a, a huge network uh, in New Mexico and Arizona, especially in the Albuquerque area. 
we have a small network uh, here in Ontario, uh, quite a big network in Croatia, and we have a big network growing now in um, uh, in New Zealand, uh, Western Australia, around Perth, and the rest of the world. Uh, really, anyone who can install uh, this camera, they just do it and realize, oh, this is so cool. They add a few more, and networks just slowly start popping out uh, everywhere. And uh, the, the final data product that we contribute are meteor orbits. So everything that you can see in this graph uh, are individual meteors that were observed for which we have observations from multiple stations where we got the trajectory. And these big blobs are meteor showers. And what we can do then is compute the activity profile of every meteor shower where we go in, we do all sorts of calibrations, figure out the size of the field of view and the intersection of the atmosphere, apply all sorts of sensitivity corrections. And this year we actually got to test uh, our system in real time where there was a, a big outburst of the Tau Herculids. Um, they are little pieces of dust that were ejected very, very recently uh, in 1995. Usually, most of the meteors that we see were ejected from the parent comets a long time ago, hundreds, thousands of years. Uh, and within 24 hours, we were able to exactly characterize the orbit and exactly characterize the activity profile, which is this kind of very nice, sharp, peak, we were able to basically demonstrate the big question was, you know, how big is the outburst? Is it going to be dangerous for any space assets? Turns out, yes, the outburst did happen, uh, but the peak uh, ZL hourly rate, the ZHR, was only about maybe 20, 20 to 25. Nothing to write home about, but we observed it and we completed the analysis within 24 hours, which previously sometimes it took years for things to get published and properly analyzed. And we just wanted to streamline all that work, all that calibration, and have good information uh, in a very short time. So this is where I'm going to complete my talk. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. I, I hope you weren't bored. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, uh, I'm here. Thank you very much, De Dennis. That is amazing. We really were not bored of that. Before we move on to questions, can we thank Dennis for his talk? If you do have any questions, um, if you're on Zoom, put them in the chat. Uh, <coughs> those, if you're on YouTube, put them in the in the chat there. We'll hopefully have time to read some of those out as well. Um, while we're waiting for that, um, can I introduce you to someone else who's on Zoom with us, which is um, Mark McIntyre. So Mark is uh, from the UK Meteor Network, and I'm pretty sure Mark's been rather busy over the last couple of days. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I, I wonder if Mark and, and you, Dennis, because I know you're involved as well, would like to say a few words about um, the fireball that was seen all across um, Scotland and raised so much interest. Um, I know when, when the, the data first came out, it, it was thought to be space debris. If I, I was interviewed on Scottish TV and I was um, telling them that's what we currently thought. And by the time it was broadcast, um, I think Mark and Dennis had done so much together to say it exactly wasn't that. So maybe, Mark, Dennis, you could say a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, what do you want to say? So initially, as far as I understand, no one really looked at the data, properly analyzed it. People just visually inspected the videos and it appeared that it might have been a re-entry, but it's really hard to say because if you don't really know the trajectory, if you don't know the geometry, for example, if there's a meteor coming right towards you, it would, it's going to appear that it's slow or going away from you. Just the, the, the apparent angular velocity is going to seem that it's slow, right? And that, that was basically... Um, what happened was a couple of videos that did surface um, just because of it, it was right between, um, uh, I was uh, thinking the Irish Sea, uh, it just appeared as if it was slow. However, when we actually combined the data from multiple locations um, and I went in, did the measurements in the videos, computed the orbit, turns out, nope, it's a piece of an asteroid. Um, it's just had a very shallow entry angle, uh, which again, that's how re-entries look like, uh, but nope, yep, the orbit said it went all the way all up to Mars and uh, burned up uh, 
uh, above, well, north of uh, Ireland, as far as I know. That's where, uh, if any meteorites are, that's where they fell. Uh, but we don't have that on video. We just see that it continued. Uh, but because it's over, you know, over, um, over, over water, we don't really care uh, where it landed. <laughs> Mark, yeah. I suppect you had a, few, a, bit, a busy few days. You want to tell us uh, some things that have happened for you? Yeah, I mean, I just echo what Dennis said. I hope you can hear me. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, my, my initial thought was as well that it was uh, it was space debris rather than um, rather than something uh, more interesting. Um, I thought one of my one of my cameras actually is one of the ones that caught it kind of end on. So from my perspective, it didn't look like it was moving terribly fast. And and those initial calculations suggested that it was much more slow moving than actually it turned out to be. But I, all credit goes to Dennis. Actually, he did all the hard work of finding the other cameras that had some useful data on and analyzing that. Um, and interestingly, I was I was talking to somebody not so long ago who was saying they think they heard it. They were actually camping on the south coast of Mull. Um, which can't be very far from where uh, the, the end of the track probably would have been. And they said about 10 o'clock, they heard a kind of rumbling noise as they were in their tent. Uh, so um, it's, uh, I, I, would, I would think, as Dennis said, it's almost certainly in the sea, somewhere between Isla and Mull. Uh, certainly, you know, no chance of any recovery. But, uh, but very interesting and a good example, actually, of how combining data together from multiple cameras gives you a much fuller picture. You know, the initial analysis just from a couple of cameras gave us one set of data but bringing in those other cameras really enhanced that picture and gave us a much better picture of the full track that it was traveling along better idea of the velocity the angles um and that kind of thing uh, unfortunately because it was through thin cloud it wasn't possible to do good measurements of say magnitude and, and that would help us estimate you know some kind of idea of how big it was but you know just given what we had uh, it, it's it's pretty incredible we managed to get as much as we did and i think you know it emphasizes again how important it is that we have as many cameras as possible um covering the areas that currently we've got gaps in um you know and um and yeah so very exciting and it's a shame it didn't uh, didn't land on ground but you know as dennis says these kind of things are coming along more and more often and the more cameras we get the more we are picking up we've you know in the last couple of years in the uk we've seen three or possibly four that may have dropped meteorites so um, that's uh, that's really where we're we're trying to get with this. I suspect the person who heard it while camping on Mull is here with us. Tosh, is that you? Yeah, that that was me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Mark, thank you for your <laughs> reply to that. It was it was interesting because yeah, we'd kind of been sea kayaking all day and we're absolutely knackered, so went to bed really early. And um, yeah, I heard, heard this rumble just just for a second, probably. It just sounded like a thunderclap, um, but very very short duration and. Um, um, we kind of thought in the morning, well, you know, wondered what that was. And then Mark, Mark, uh, there's my wife here who heard it as well. You see, but Wendy and Tosh, we both heard it. And uh, yeah, and then Mark, uh, Mark Phillips um, contacted us when, when we were back on mobile, um, when we got to Craig Muir and said, have you heard about the meteor? And we, we didn't know anything about it. And then, um, yeah, it all clicked together. It was 10 o'clock in the evening slight rumble and mark confirmed that indeed meteors or fireballs can create noise when they when they enter yeah. okay shall, shall we move on to, to questions peter are you ready to read some of us we have some questions yeah uh ian ian had a fairly straightforward one ian are you there ian smith yeah um if you can only afford one um which direction is the best um direction yeah, that's a good question. So it really depends where you are. Um, and usually I ask people to send me their location and we look at other cameras in the area and we find the best pointing direction for that. If you are um, alone, but probably you're not, um, there are probably some cameras in the area. I usually tell people just to point where there aren't any obstructions and to aim for an elevation angle of about 45 degrees. That's the best meteor wise. Okay, so there's um, there's not a particular direction which has more incidents than anywhere else. Yeah, it all depends on where the radiant is that you're looking at. Um, some people aim to install very narrow field of view cameras uh, that have very long focal length lenses, and those cannot point south because the sun would simply burn the sensor. Uh, but if you buy these normal uh, wide field lenses, you can point them anywhere you want. That's great. Andy Lawrence has an enigmatic question. 
Yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll wait because it's not actually about meteorites. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what Andy's question is about. We'll come to that later on, yes. <laughs> well, the next, the next one's not about me to write either, but it's an interesting one. Is that, is that Jamie or Jim? I, can't, I don't know how to pronounce the, the name. Yes, sorry. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, it's kind of uh, in the gray zone, but is there a consensus surrounding Oumuamua yet or any advancements on that? By consensus, do you mean it's interstellar origin or... Yeah, it just seems like all the information I've looked up about it is kind of everyone's divided and split on their what they think about it. I mean, Oumuamua is definitely interstellar. We have enough observations to say with, I don't know how many, seven sigma, uh, that it is interstellar. In terms of what it actually is, um, that is still open to speculation simply because we don't have a lot of observations. It, 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 we already, we only discovered it while it was going out and we only got a few extra observations, a few spectral observations, and now we will probably never be able to observe it again. So it's just kind of like uh, when you have those connect the dots and you're trying to get a picture and you, you're missing a lot of dots. So you can really draw in everything you want. Uh, and that's why there's so many, there's so much speculation about what it could be. It, it, we'll never know. It's simple as that. Thank you for that. David, David Ramshaw. <clears throat> I've seen one or two fireballs over Cumbria over the last 20 or 30 years. And some of them are very colourful, and usually I think it's turned out that the more colourful ones are re-entering space debris. Um, and what I've noticed about them is how slow they, they can be. And I take it that's because they're very high up and a long way away. Um, yeah. Is it easy to, to distinguish? Do you quickly, you know, which is which? Do you do it by the colour as well as the trajectory, or how do you go about it? distinguishing re-entering space debris as opposed to a meteoroid from uh, asteroid origins or comet origins? Yeah, so we don't usually go by color. And uh, if you notice that all our cameras are black and white, um, and the reason is that people have actually tried using colors, observed colors, and actually like fully like calibrated cameras with like meteor spectrum and with multiple observations of both to, to see if, if anything useful would come out if you observe meteors in color. Turns out no, uh, because there are so many different spectral lines that overlap. There's like magnesium, calcium, iron, blah, blah, blah. They all like, if you see a certain color, it doesn't mean that it's rich in a certain element because it could also be another element. It's also speed dependent. So we just decided to run everything black and white and save a lot of uh, disk space. Now, in terms of discerning between re-entries and something that comes from the asteroid belt, some natural objects, it's actually quite, quite easy. Uh, all re-entries are in an Earth orbit, so they're much slower. The Earth's escape velocity is 11 kilometers a second, and Basically, you cannot form an orbit around the sun if you're slower than that. So this fireball that we observed a couple of days ago, its velocity was 14 kilometers a second. So there is no possible way that it could have been orbiting Earth. It had to be orbiting sun, right? And we get like a full orbit and everything. So if it's, a, if it's space junk, it has to orbit Earth. And we do not know of many or of many natural objects except the moon and one or two other asteroids that are orbiting Earth. It's just simple as that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, at that point, it's back to Andy. Well, there are a couple of questions on YouTube, and then we'll go back to Andy after that, if you want to do that, if that's okay. okay. Will, do you want to read out a couple of questions on YouTube? You can find those. Yeah. <clears throat> um, great talk there, uh, Dennis. It was very enjoyed by all. Um, you had uh, viewers from Greece, Denmark, uh, Kenya, USA, and more locally, Gretna Green and Sky. So all over the world, basically, which is good. A um, couple of questions. One from um, Richard Ottolini. How many meteor showers are seen a year? And I suppose I could enlarge on that just um, a little bit. 
do you think there will be more meteor showers sort of created by all this new data coming in? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, in meteor science, we have a big problem, and that is we don't have a definition of what a meteor shower is. Uh, you can't really say, yeah, so right now the International Astronomical Union has a list of meteor showers, and they have established meteor showers, man, several, several dozen, um, I don't think we are maybe a hundred, uh, that we know these are meteor showers for real. Pe people have seen them many times, they've been really observed, there's no question about it. And then there's over a thousand of meteor showers on the working list where uh, one group has observed a shower, but others haven't. Uh, we still don't know, we're starting to figure out. There are some meteor showers that are extremely weak. Uh, there are some outbursts that, let's say, might have happened once and never again, and they haven't really been observed that well. So it's really hard to draw the line. Um, however, there are, new showers that are like created not by our network but simply because of the, the comets and everything how it works so um last year we had the erids so they were actually created or a brand new meteor shower created by an outburst of one comet some decades ago so things happen and that's why we have to monitor the changes in activity and um, how can I put the, the big showers that everyone observes, the Perseids and the Geminids, they're kind of boring. They never really change, except every once in a while, the Perseids might have an outburst that no one expects. Like last year, there was a huge Perseid outburst, ZHR over 300, that no one uh, predicted. And we observed it and we actually published a paper about it. Um, on the other hand, the Geminids, which happen every year regularly, uh, they are kind of they they are very regular but the problem with the geminids is that no one has any clue how they were they, how they were created you look at their parent body the uh, the asteroid phaeton it is not active at all it, there's like nothing coming out of it all the other showers they have comets and things are produced the geminids though and it's it's so big mystery so all these observations the more observations we can make the higher quality observations we can do is going to help us to figure out what's going on with all these different comets and asteroids. That's ex excellent. Thank you. And um, just, I've just got a, a, a little question here. I'm mm -hmm. sort of interested in meteorite hunting, but I'm always sort of, um, my, my gut feeling is that people underestimate the uh, amount of debris which falls from a fireball. When you, know, when you hear these published things come out, we expect just a few grams or something. I feel it's much underestimated than maybe there, 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 there is. And I just wondered what your feelings were on that. And then this leads on to just a final little question from um, Simon Waters. Is there a feed with just the falls near me on the website. This is kind of looking forward to the future if, the, if we're getting meteorite falls all the time, you know, which would be very unlikely, but uh, you just you mentioned that. So, okay, so the first question, is there more than we think? Um, we can actually quite accurately, we have good observations, quantify how much stuff is falling. Do within an order of magnitude, more or less, by maybe even a factor of four to five. So let's say recently there was a meteorite fall in New Zealand. We know that if it was rocky, there's between two and 10 kilograms of material on the ground. That's not really the big question. Uh, the big question usually is where is it and how it's distributed? So we usually see one single rock falling down uh, at the end. And then it turns off, the light production stops, and then it falls down, and that's called dark flight. You can't observe it. It, it cooled down, no light is being produced, and during that dark flight, it can fragment. And that really throws a spanner into works because we assume that's all one piece falling down, and then we assume different masses, and you get kind of the, the distribution on the ground. But if it fragments, then small pieces went somewhere else, and then you don't have any big pieces, it's all in a different place. Um, and what can also happen is that smaller pieces can get ejected before the end of the fireball. 
and they're usually kind of behind. And all that stuff is really hard to observe and predict. Um, however, what people usually do is if nothing big gets found, they usually go to the zone where the smaller meteorites are supposed to be or smaller pieces. And then just because there should be more of them, uh, people go and find something small there, but the big mass of maybe, I don't know, hundreds of grams, kilograms, that doesn't get found because just it's hard to find a one, right? Uh, but in terms of how much there is, it's, yeah, we, we have a good idea. That's excellent. Um, what is the second question? If there is meteorites the, falling, the second the second question was from uh, a, a gentleman on on YouTube, and it was really I suppose it was kind of uh, looking forward to the future of a website where it had cameras everywhere, and there would be a button which said finds you know just the finds oh. finds near me falls near me something like that. Oh, so yeah, falls near. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, um, well, we know statistically that over an area of uh, 1 million square kilometers, every year there should be uh, maybe two to five meteorite falls with a mass larger than 300 grams or so. Um, so that's basically the uh, area the size of, let's say, France gets two to, two to five meteorites that one would potentially be able to find uh, every year. That's quite sizable. That's kind of like 300 grams. It's a nice piece of rock, right? Uh, the problem, of course, is that, you know, terrain, weather, et cetera, et cetera. So it's usually you maybe get one find a year, and that's if you're lucky. Um, and, yeah, um, it, it's just they don't happen that often. Uh, it's usually something on a, you know, in a, in a larger country. It might take several years until even one uh, is found, even though if you had a camera is everywhere. Right. That's excellent. Thank you. Could, could I just add something there? Sorry. Um, there I, I was just going to say that if, if people are interested in, in finding out more about things that have actually fallen, at least in the UK, we do have the UK Fireball Alliance, which um, is helping to distribute information about fireballs and things that, that, like that that we've observed. That UK Fall were actually involved in the, uh, in the work we were doing a couple of days ago. So uh, their website is somewhere that they will have information about, I think it's ukfold.org, but I can check. Um, their website will have information about, certainly in the UK, where, where things have happened, um, if you're interested in, in finding out more about that. Uh, and you can also contact me and I can put you in touch with them. And if you go to the UK Meteor Network website, there are daily reports on, on everything that happens. Mark's put a lot of um, amazing reports and data on there as well, so you can see exactly what's happened the night before, all the things that have been captured over the UK. Uh, really good. Um, I think that's all the, the, those questions. So, uh, uh, Andy Lawrence, um, would you would you like to uh, pose your question there? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, let me just say first of all, the the sprites look amazing. So I certainly hope somebody's doing something with those. Very very spooky. Um, okay. So my question was um, whether the meteor cameras are uh, are picking up satellites. And whether and, and if so, whether somebody is systematic, systematically cataloging them. Uh, and uh, well, I'll just let you answer the question and I'll tell you why, not, why I'm asking. Yeah, so uh, we do observe a lot of satellites. Uh, and right now we do have one uh, group that is trying to use them, use the observations to actually do the positional measurements and help improve the orbits, especially of the of um, um, the new mega constellations uh, because there are just so many of these satellites and they're so bright our cameras do pick them up uh, and people do want to know where they are um, usually there's the uh, leo labs and other groups they use uh, radars to track these objects um, however, they usually all work in what's called a fence, uh, which is just basically kind of a, a beam across the sky, right? Uh, but they can't pick them, pick them all of them up across the whole sky. What we do is we can actually track it from the beginning to the end with every camera across the globe and provide much better, um, much better orbital constraints because the orbits of these satellites change all the time because of atmospheric effects and et cetera, et cetera. So, there is a group working on this. 
Um, but I, um, I might contact you um, uh, about that. I mean, the, the context is that, um, uh, well, the guys here know that, yeah, I'm uh, obsessed with the, the satellite mega constellation issue, uh, mm -hmm. campaign on that issue. But um, we, um, we, we have a, uh, a camera on the rooftop of the Royal Observatory, which is basically just a digital camera pointing straight up. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we've been using that to, to track satellites uh, and it, 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 so it doesn't do video. Basically, it does a five second exposure the whole night. Um, and amongst other things, we've recently been thinking, you know, we should really kind of clone this system, uh, and as a, as a kit, uh, and get people to, to, to basically kind of, you know, inspired by the, the sort of way that you guys have been doing things. Um, but then I thought, well, you know, uh, maybe we don't even need it if you're picking up the information we need already. Um, and uh, I think this information needs to be fed through in particular to the new IAU Centre. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd be quite keen to find out what, uh, what, what you got. Yeah, you can actually tune the detection algorithm to uh, detect satellites instead of meteors. To differentiate between the two, it's quite easy. Uh, we we reject all the satellite detections and you know it's satellite because it's moving less than two degrees a second across the sky. Uh, but you can just shift the detection range and say, I want everything that's moving up to two degrees a second and not faster. And that's usually a satellite, right? Uh, yeah. And you would get individual points, you would get it where it is and you would get the magnitude estimates if that's something that you were interested, how bright it is. So, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 all those things. Um, okay, great, thanks. Yeah, I think you'll find, Andy, that we, we detect far more satellites than we do meters with our meter cameras. So and there's, there's loads of data there already. Okay, I think that those are all the questions uh, for tonight. That was a, a fascinating talk. Um, in the society, we've got four uh, meter cameras on the on, on the networks now. We we saw that Scotland was very poorly covered, so we thought let's let's give it a go. So and um, we have a few more people interested. I think we point north, south, and southeast. So there's still a few other points to to fill in. If anyone's interested, we can we can help you out doing that. I noticed Mark Gatos is on on, on YouTube. He has one down in Gretna, so. A lot of the meters we catch, we match, match with him. So that helps with the, the orbit determinations, et cetera. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great fun thing. You get up in the morning, get your cup of coffee and have a look at what your cameras detected last night. And it's really good. So thank you to Dennis and to Mark as well. And um, everyone, um, hopefully we'll see you at um, a future talk. Um, thank you very much. Good night.